Okay. For those of you that are watching the recorded version, we apparently lost our internet connection for a little bit, so we are back again. Um, we're just finishing up on the discussion of operational report, uh, operational expectations policy for OE4, the uh, personal administration. Um, and so we were just discussing as far as the format of the summary and process of getting the summary back to um, board president for summarization to be put on the consent agenda for next month. Um, and then um, the following part of that is then, like I said, it will come up and will be posted on board docs on the consent agenda next month so people can read both the whole report plus the summary of our comments from this meeting or the highlights from this meeting. And um, that basically then will get approved and be part of our uh, evaluation of those operational expectations. So, any other comments on OE4? Okay. Seeing none, then we will go ahead and proceed to item uh, 5.03, which is to report on the capital project bond. And for that, I will turn things over to Mark. Thank you. So, um, still making progress on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the high school. So we received this week the um, much awaited uh, permit for the grandstand. Um, so that is underway, and and uh, remember that got um, uh, pushed up in the schedule um, to uh, mitigate cost. Um, they were anticipating a pretty significant uh, increase in the cost to the to the uh, materials to construct the grandstand. So, in order to kind of beat that higher price increase, we pushed the schedule up. Uh, so they've been doing the ex excavation, getting the, the footings, everything ready to pour, and uh, just got the permits. So and now they can um, keep that part of the project moving. So. Um, part of our big theme throughout the entire project is to kind of do everything we can to mitigate the cost escalation, and that's one of the big one of the big steps. So that's a good one to get um, get knocked out. The uh, steel is uh, for the first phase of the project, so the the athletic wing and the um, uh, uh, commons area classroom wing is um, pretty much complete. They've got the, the cranes have left. Um, the slabs have been poured on the on the uh, second floor um, and part of the third floor, um, which is pretty exciting. They're doing the rough in uh, of all the electrical and the uh, plumbing. It's good. A lot of the HVAC is in there, so it's actually going there. It's starting to look like a little bit of a building. Um, if you've been in a house, it's uh, kind of studs and and got the the rough end going. It's a little, looking a little bit like that, only metal and a lot bigger. Um, so it's it's pretty fun. You can get wire yard in the building. Um, it's interesting. The, the third floor is probably at least twenty or thirty degrees colder than it is on the bottom just to get, uh, get things enclosed for the winter because it's um, dramatically uh, dramatically different. Um, one of the kind of the more exciting pieces, I think, um, is that this Thursday, um, we're actually, um, uh, Cornerstone has agreed to give some uh, tours for the high school staff. Um, so it'll be the first time that a lot of the, the staff um, have actually been able to go and tour the, the new building. So uh, we thought that would be kind of a nice, uh, uh, little bonus or little route booster going into the break. So um, they're going to conduct several tours for, for staff to get to go see that. Is the progress of the building? Is it possible for someone within Cornerstone or the staff to like videotape that tour that we could post it that the community could look, you know, well, could view it online or something? Maybe I will ask. So we, um, one of the other things that is, if you remember the video that Cornerstone did on the, um, uh, what they did the, on the, on the, the concrete the pours and the, they've done another one with the steel erection hmm. um, that should be out very soon. Um, so that is very exciting. It's a, a three, five minute video, something like that for 
and it goes through the whole process of the of the steel erection and and um, does a nice job of kind of capturing progress on the building um, that'll out, be out pretty soon. But I'll see if they can get some uh, video footage from the from the tours as well. It's just always cool when you start seeing walls and you can start to envision classrooms a little bit. You can really start to see it take shape now because you've got the, the two wings and the commons is together. So it's you really get a sense for the scale and what it's gonna what it's gonna look like. We as it's starting to get more and more stuff and value stuff of value in there. I'm thinking like you know when wires start getting put in and everything. What's the security like overnight and such? To make Security's pretty top notch. They're um, in fact they had uh, uh, somebody uh, come in and, and uh, paint some tag or whatever they do on a trailer and, and something else. So they have actually uh, made an agreement with uh, Fernando Police Department. So they have keys and access to the site. Um, they've installed more video cameras. Um, so it's actually under pretty good video surveillance at night. Uh, um, and uh, when it's occupied, so the, the lights perimeter, the uh, cones are alerted uh, to the video can cameras and it's actually monitored. Uh, from a security um, uh, company as well, so it's it's pretty uh, pretty tight security. That Van Gogh exhibit down in Seattle, it was broken into, and they took all of their wiring, like mm. the night before Thanksgiving. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thinking like we probably are going to have some pretty nice wiring. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's all cheap, bad wiring. Cheap. Might even be cheap. Up and two, by the way. Wi-Fi access and things that way. So, any questions for Mark? Um, I think if I read the update right, this week's update will be the last for the year. We're since the the two the next two are uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. We decided to take a couple of weeks off. After 136 weeks, we've taken two off. That sounds reasonable. All right. Yeah. Two weeks off. <laughs> Those are appreciated. It's always fun to see the pictures. It's fun to drive by. And now, you know, with it up, you start seeing more and more. Room. And I'll remind everybody, the website has a lot more pictures. Yes. There's a lot of, of photos on there. They're pretty cool. Okay. okay. There's no other questions, and we'll go ahead and move on to item 5.04, which is an update on the February Ferndale School District levy. And um, for that, I will turn it over again to Mark. Yes, and I am actually going to turn it over to Mrs. Layton. So I, this is quite a treat for me to um, <laughs> give uh, uh, <laughs> a lovely presentation. But this is a, a, a PowerPoint that we put together. That there's a group of us that have been working on the district end to provide information. Because if you recall, the, as district employees, we provide information. We cannot campaign uh, for the for on school district time. We provide information only. So actually put together. Together, a PowerPoint. Um, uh, Heather, Faye, uh, Jamie Plankovich, and uh, and Rab Dillon um, have kind of primarily been working on on putting this together. So we this PowerPoint uh, for our principals to go out and deliver to all members, um, so they had the facts and knew um, what was going on with the levy. So we're going to share that with you today. And since Heather delivered that to her staff, um, she's agreed to uh, come here and deliver it for us. Um, if I can just before, just so I don't forget to do this, but just as a reminder to the board members as well, um, our role is the same in the sense of if we're using our district email, um, then all we can do as far as the levy is provide information. We can't encourage people to vote for it. Um, we, if we, you know, if you're using your personal email, then you're good to go. But again, there's can be some pretty serious um, fines and repercussions if you use your school district email to promote, um, do anything other than provide just straight information. So I just want to make sure that 
you guys were aware of that. Um, so. Mark's loving his delegating authority. <laughs> haven't noticed he's has a big smile to make this mask right yeah if it wasn't for the mask we'd even see it more but. i know just seeing his eyebrows <laughs> so um mark had asked me to run through the information that administrator shared with our buildings last week um, this is also the same informational PowerPoint that we um, informational PowerPoint with elimination last week um, and to share that information. So um, first slide, Jackson. So that's the second slide. It's on it's on presentation. Okay. Okay. So it might feel like um, we just did. So if you remember, we did one fifty. So now we're at the point where we are doing, we're renewing that levy because it will expire December of twenty twenty two. So um, once again, it's time to put up our sleeves and get the information out to our community, get the information out to our administrators, so that. Um, the intent was when families, administrators, teachers, paras, classified staff go home and spend time with their families that they have this information and they have talking points that they can share information with families in broader circles. Um, so next slide. So a little bit about us. Um, we have about 700 employees in our district and approximately 4,400 um, students in grades pre-school through 12. We have nine schools and we are one of the largest employers in Fergo. One of the things that gets a little messy is um, the difference between bonds and levies. So um, a way to think about it is, um, yes, we do have um, a bond going on right now that's helping build our high school. And the way to think about it is bonds are for buildings and levies are for learning. Um, bonds are like a mortgage and levies are what is sort of you what to think about how we pay our utility bill in those cases. Um, those funds cannot be used, um, sorry, bond funds cannot be used for operational expenditures. They're very different funding sources and they can't commingle. So think about bonds are for buildings and levies are for learning and that helps you understand which pot of money can be used for what. So some district highlights. Um, in the event to be a little bit interactive through these slides, I want you to think about and maybe share with me one or two things that you can think of other than what's on the slides right there that are highlights of our district. What are some things that we have done really well that um, our levy supported or levy funded? Can we think of something? Our be music, proud of our music programs. Our music programs and, and if you noticed, the parking lot was full when you came in and they weren't super excited about the board meeting. They were super excited about the <laughs> that was going on. So music, absolutely. Anything else? All extracurricular, well, many extracurricular. Okay. Extracurricular activities. Our FFA just did really well at nationals a month and a half ago. Yep, our FFA. So all things that support our students through the levy. Oh, the Math Olympiad just started too. Math Olympiad just started. Our, our elementary kiddos and our middle school kiddos look forward to that every single year. And we have great competitors every single year. And um, some of the district highlights that we've thought about is um, we were the first dis district in Whatcom County to get all of our students back in the building to in-person learning safely. That was a huge milestone for us to be able to get our um, our teachers um, in, our students in, back to full-time in-person learning. So we did that in April of 2021. Um, we have a really in-depth um, focus on academics along with social emotional learning for our students. And our district um, uses technology and with one-on-one -on -one devices in grades three through 12. 
So why are we asking the community to consider the renewal levy? levy? Well, we know that Washington State does not fully fund K-12 education and voter approved local levies help bridge the gap between what the state funds and what we need um, for our education system. Um, it's important to remember, I mentioned this at the beginning, but our current levy does expire at the end of 2022. Um, this is a replacement levy and the rate will remain the same. So the board has, has decided to do a dollar 50 and when levy renews, we're asking for a dollar 50. So we're asking to um, use that money to maintain what we're currently able to do. So ESSER funds, you hear this a lot about, um, maybe the assumption might not, sometimes I've heard that the assumption is that maybe we don't need levy funding because we have ESSER funds. So the important thing to remember about ESSER funds is that they are funds that were um, provided to us to meet this, the academic and social emotional health and well-being of our students as a result of the pandemic. So um, some of the things that we have used um, our ESSER funds are things that are very different than what we're using levy funds for. So up there you'll see, um, we are gonna use um, our ESSER funds for technology. We are replenishing um, devices within our organization. We um, have implemented a multi-tier systems of support. So we have three-year positions um, in each one of our buildings. And you've heard and seen reports on the MTSS model in prior meetings. Um, we are doing a K-5 for curriculum for English and language arts, and we're doing a K-12 math adoption. Um, we've also had intervention specialists at each one of our buildings. And um, speaking for my building alone, I have seen Crystal Craft in my building do absolutely amazing things with intervention, with um, working with groups of students to help them not only with behavior concerns, but academics concerns, working with teachers. I heard Peggy say, um, you know, what are we, sometimes teachers get overwhelmed and are we taking their care of their social emotional well-being too? Crystal has been an amazing collaborator in her intervention position in providing teacher support. Um, she's a very skilled and very seasoned teacher, so she does an amazing job of going into classrooms and helping some of our teachers that might just be a little bit more overwhelmed, um, especially our new teachers. So she, it's, it's been an amazing position at our building, and we're seeing a lot of benefits out of that. Um, we also have ESSER funds that we've used um, for um, COVID support with our nurses and our testing and our for our educators and whatnot. And the key, the member of our conversations, for those that are new that didn't have the conversations about the ESSER funds, they're short-term monies, right? They have to be spent within three years and then they go away. So it's important that you'll notice all of these things are short-term expenditures that will expand our capabilities and expand our um, uh, programs beyond the three years, but they're not committing us to expenditures beyond that three-year funding cycle, right? So we can't hire a bunch of staff that we won't be able to afford once the funding goes away. So this is all stuff with a three-year specific time frame that it, it goes away, but we end up um, with significant investment in the programs um, that'll impact us well beyond three years. Are the intervention specialists part of the MTSS? It, it's part of that model. Yeah, it's part of that model. And it is also, like Mark said, a, a very short term funded position with ESSER funds. So, um, is there a chart somewhere that shows the breakdown of how you decided to allocate? Yes. He's okay. Yeah. Where do I find that? That is, I think, on our website. It's probably So, we located it today on the website. Yeah. On the left hand side, there is a, a column that has a bunch of headers, and one of those is Levy. Okay. And then on the, when you go to the levy part of the website, there, there's a couple of questions. And one of the questions says um, the ESSER funds. No, the ESSER funds. Yes, right. and there's actually a PowerPoint presentation there also that has a great visual that shows the distribution of it. Is that, is that the PowerPoint that you have for the meeting comes back or is it additional? It, the chart will be what was in the uh, what we looked at in the board meeting. So then is there like a further breakdown as far as where it says replenish aging devices? You know, what, what schools are getting upgrades in that? Every uh, teacher in the district is getting a new laptop. Okay. Does that include paras and? No, every teacher in the district is getting a laptop. With the ESSER funds.
They're not kids devices. The kids were funded through a different program, a different funding source. Yeah, we just got a bunch of those at the beginning. Of, we got a we got, we we can give you a breakdown on all the different funding sources that we've had the student devices from, but the the next order of student devices that we're waiting from was a separate funding uh, that came specifically for student devices. It actually partially offset the cost of the staff devices as well. And that funding did not include funding for uh, paraeducators. It was very specific on what the, what the funding was for. So um, again, the levy continues to fund continues continues the funding that we currently have to support students directly. Um, provides access to resources that students need, and some of those things we talked about, like clubs, athletic, or support programs. Um, everybody's salary within the organization comes from the levy in one way or another. Um, the important thing to think about this is that um, our levy dollars go directly to benefit our kids. So again, this slide, um, I want you to look at the list for a minute. And then as you're reading through those 10 categories, 12, whatever's up there, testing my eyesight, um, I want you to think about how each one of those positions right there impact kids. How do they benefit kids? So how do our nurses benefit kids? How do our transportation benefit kids? How do our kids benefit from counselors? How do they benefit from clubs? How do they benefit from paraeducators? And if something comes to mind, somebody want to tell me maybe how transportation benefits kids? Well, I can tell you that the bus drivers are the first ones to greet our children when they pick them up in the morning and they can pretty much make or break their day just by being kind and welcoming and, uh, you know. Yep. Exactly what I thought and exactly think the same thing we talked about with our staff. Our bus drivers are the very first people to greet our children when they come on the door and those positions are absolutely critical to a child having a good day or a poor day or turning a bad day into a good day. Um, Simple greeting, simple, I'm happy to see you. Simple, um, have a good day could, could turn that child's day around. So absolutely a critical position. What about nurses? How do nurses benefit our students? Well, with all the COVID stuff, helping to uh, navigate this illness or helping to provide comfort to them, particularly with the younger children when they're not feeling good. Absolutely. How do our paraeducators benefit our students? That extra connection and the extra help that students might need or supervision that they might need or just assistance. They fill so many gaps that um, you might have. Um, our paraeducators are a critical, critical part of our education system. Um, they provide support to all students. They provide support to our administrators. They provide support to our teachers. They provide support to our families. Um, and I, um, I actually remember being in, I don't know if it was second grade or third grade at Mountain View Elementary School, and I was determined, I was determined to learn how to double dutch jump rope. And we had a particular paraeducator. And I remember for the life of me, he would not let me quit. I don't know how many times I got slapped with that rope. But, you know, I think about that quite often in my adult life. It might have been just double dutch in the playground. But I remember this person looking at me and coaching me and telling me I could do it. And when you feel good about doing something, that carries on into the classroom. And I don't know if I've ever, I don't know that I've ever told her this story, but it was actually Miss Rogley here. I'm still doing it. <laughs> but she twirled those, but I, I remember the day she looked at me and I was going to give up and she said, you could do this. You could do this. And I thought, I can. I can do this. So, um, not just the academic piece, but, you know, our paraeducators have so much contact with our kids every single day. And they, and, and, and our middle school right here in my middle school, 
our care educators find out things that are going outside at recess time before kids even get into the building and those walkie talkie comes in hand and as soon as Johnny's coming through the door the paraeducators gotten a hold of us and they're like how did you know well we have good paraeducators outside so what about our coaches um, I think I can say this with this because I'm in almost all the most of the club at the high school but um, without coaches and clubs no student will have the opportunity do what they do to experience extracurriculars, to have fun, to have spirits, and to just go to school and know that there are something for them at the end of the day. Yep. They're, uh, they're great mentors. Yep, great mentors. And motivators. And motivators. Yep. And research, research shows us that it takes one adult, one caring adult to make a difference in a child's life most times. So coaches, nurses, bus drivers, maintenance teachers, counselors, educators, food services, right? Like, I don't know too many people that want to get up at four o'clock in the morning on really poor weather days sometimes to come here and make sure that our kids are fed. And sometimes those kids don't get another meal in another place. So thinking about this list, there's... If you think about the things that we talked about, it would be it, it would be a really hard thing. And it was a really hard thing when we had to lay off 100, about 100 staff member when we failed our levy um, a short time ago, because it were, it were exactly these things that you're talking about that we had to cut and we had to make those decisions. So um, the levy is... Um, hugely, hugely beneficial for our students. And I just can't think of another way to say it other than all of our positions that support students are um, much needed. So we need to make sure that we do what I, we can do to get this information out so that we can accurate information to our community so that they can make a decision. Um, so like I said, um, when our levy failed in 2020, um, I think the number was approximately 100 staff that we had to cut off, we had to lay off or cut. Um, next slide, Jackson. This we talked about a little bit, but we'll talk about it. So the levy helps fund our academic programs, so special education, our advanced learning, um, which, is, which in our K-8 is what we call our magnet programs. On um, our high school, we have our, our AP classes and other accelerated classes that we have. Helps fund smaller class size. Um, our eight period high school schedule um, and our um, electives in the high school, which are um, helps our kids be career ready, like sports med, vet, vet tech, AutoCAD. Um, it's not on this list, but I always tell Mr. Menifee it's my absolute favorite elective ever, and it is ballroom dancing. Mm -hmm. And you might not think ballroom dancing is important, but ballroom dancing is important. And um, I'll tell you the story that I told my staff. Um, my son, who's six foot four, who is not coordinated, he's a lineman, um, not very coordinated, big, big kid. And there was a day when I went down to the high school and probably bringing him something to eat or something to drink or something. And he says, well, I'm in the cafeteria, I'm in ballroom dancing. And I thought, really? But anyway, when you walk in there, what is beautiful about that particular class is my son who, football player, athlete, in his letterman's jacket, was dancing with a girl that he may not have ever made contact with in the hallway. Um, not from the same social group, definitely didn't hang out, definitely didn't see each other in the hallway very often. But what that class did was it built that connection between him and her. And to see them later on have a relationship with each other outside of ballroom dancing was absolutely amazing. So give classes like that, give kids the opportunity to make connections with each other and build relationships with, the other, with each other. And those relationships then in turn help build our community as a whole. So I love Mr. Menifee. I love ballroom dancing. I did not like the homework because he cannot dip his mother <laughs> to save his life. Um, but I do love the class. So I'm glad we brought it back. Or was it his mother couldn't dip? I couldn't dip, and I, I had a little bit of trust issues with it. <laughs> I will admit, 
but um, mm. just that camaraderie, you know, that it, that it rubs. I took Brandon at the same time. Guy and took color and dancing, and he loved it. And yeah. that's the class I never, ever would have put my kid as. I know. Doing any, you know. It was, it's actually, if you, if you have it, you ever have an opportunity to see it, it is the, one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen, see kids that would, may not ever have a relationship with each other, finding that rhythm and that connection through music and being able to salsa and communicate that way with each other. It's incredible. It's teaching them things that they don't even know. So that's $11. Uh, let's See next slide. Um, we've talked about this technology. Our levy helps fund technology. So our six, twelve kids, um, they get their own device. Our three, five kids are provided their own device, and their devices stay in their classroom. And then our K two kids are provided access um, to a device at school. Next slide. Again, we've talked about some of these. They help fund after school tutoring, athletics, music, drama, robotics, STEM, math Olympiad, any clubs that we have. Um, all those things that help our students make a connection to our school and to their peers outside of the classroom. So, um, but the levy is not a new tax. It replaces our expiring levy and it will, re it will maintain at the current rate. Um, and in 2023, the tax rate will be no higher than $1.50 for 1,000 one assessed value. Again, we keep saying it, but it's a, re it's a replacement levy. It's a replacement levy. It's replacing the levy that we currently have. Next slide, Jackson. Um, this slide right here is a bar graph, um, and it shows you that Ferndale is the second lowest. I think Blaine is the lowest in terms of what we're asking for from our voters. Gives you the visual of what other districts are asking, and right now we are the second lowest in the county. I have a question on that one. It's playing low because they have BP. Mm -hmm. it, they get, they get their maximum collection at a lower tax rate. That's right. why they're lower. Because they because have they have a higher tax base with has, the refineries. Okay. So some key facts. Um, our current levy expires December 30, 31st, 2022. This is a replacement levy. It's not a new tax. The tax rate will not increase or remain the same at 150. It's a two-year levy. So two years from now, we will be doing the same thing. And at that, and that, when the time comes at that time, you guys will get to decide if we're going to do another two-year or four-year. Um, but it's my understanding that we went two-year, two-year, so that we could get back on track with the other schools in the county and then go every four years after that. Um, bonds are for bill levies are for learning and ballots will begin being mailed out January 19th, February by February 8th. This right here, if you haven't already, this is the QR code to um to our um what's Website. the thing you like Mark? Huh? What's it called the thing you like? Website? No to join. Thought exchange. Thought exchange. This is the QR code to the thought exchange. So um, you could take a picture of it. You can share that QR code with anybody that you happen to see over the holiday vacation. If you have a question about the levy through the thought exchange, you can see questions that other staff employees or community members have asked. Um, and you can um, you can go in and you can rate those questions. So if you hit, it's like hitting a like or a love button. So if you react to it, then that tells us this many people kind of have the same question. And so um, what we do with that information is we look at the questions and then we figure out how to write responses and include that, that feedback into um, Mark's news, newsletters on our website. It gives us a way to connect to the community and answer their questions. So that's the QR code. Feel free to share it with anybody. Um, it is a thought exchange. Thank you, Heather. Um, any questions for Heather at this point? One thing, just to know, a couple of things to just reiterate and highlight what you were saying. Um, it does seem like we just ran a levy, which we sort of did. And part of the process with that is, um, again, for information for Steve and Peggy. Um, so the levy. The current one that we passed in November of last year 
it runs till the end of 2022. And we have the opportunity, we're gonna go ahead and pass. So we have for 23 and 24, um, I'm gonna leave that out there right now. If it doesn't pass in February, if that should happen, then we have one more chance in 2022 to, to rerun it again. Um, the challenge being is that if we don't have those funds, then we have to budget. If we don't have a pass budget. We have to budget based on not having that money. And the way that school funding works, Mark, correct me if I off the top of my head say this wrong. Um, we have to let teachers and staff know by May 15th whether or not we're going to hire them for the following school year. And if we don't have a past levy, any, any uh, position that is funded by the levy or supported by that, we can't hire that person. So we have to tell them that their job is, is not going to be existent in the coming school year. Um, so that's why we do it early in February. Um, so that we have time you know, to, to deal with that. Um, another good place is in the August 2021 meeting. Um, there is the presentation of, of the citizen budget, which has a little bit more information on where those funds are going and where levy dollars and how that impacts things as well. So that's another resource if you're looking for a source of information to um, help just educate yourself and certainly avail yourself to, you know, Mark, Melinda, Jesse, and I, um, any of the admin team, if you've got other questions about that or are looking for information to share with people if they have questions you're not sure about. Um, yeah, so is there a per student cap that you're allowed to collect? I mean, you know, it's $1.50 per $1,000 to assess value, but, you know, However much you have budgeted for kids, I mean, if you're allowed to collect, what is it, twenty eight hundred dollars? I thought it was. Like that. Yeah, there's, there's two. So twenty five hundred per student. And it was adjusted. Or plus inflation. Plus inflation. Plus inflation. Yeah, I was getting to that. Guy. Sorry. <laughs> or two dollars and fifty cents um, per thousand, just, whichever yeah, one is the lesser of those two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just was wondering what that was that. I have some. And. and and that's as the graph shows why Blaine's is so low is because they max out at that. That's the most they can, can collect. Okay. Any other questions? I have one. Um, last time, almost at last year, because it feels like it, but last time we did the letter, the board members, the board actually did virtual town halls. It was last year. What was it last year? Yeah. Okay. So virtual uh, town halls for information on um, the levy. And again, I'm asked, do you want to do that again? I would. I'm I'm a town hall. So, so what we did was on the Thursday Facebook Live things. Actually, it wasn't a Thursday. No, it was separate from a separate Thursday. From the Thursday. But it was like that in that you had panelists on Facebook. And you could ask, you know, whatever community member you want to ask to be on that panel. I had like a realtor. I had, um, oh gosh, I'm totally blanking. I had a county executive. I had um, some teachers. I had friends. I had all sorts of different people, different voices. And if it were to fail, how would it affect our real estate prices? If it were to pass, how would it, you know, that sort of thing. So. Well, how is the state portion effect? I mean, you know, because our state taxes going up, state I mean, education taxes. What's I have, um, you know, you know, state collects. Yeah, I don't believe the state is doing anything different than they have. That's, I mean, that is yet to depends on what they do during the legislative session that's coming up. But there's no I haven't heard no any, noise about any increases. No, okay. no noise about any increases. Is this one of the? This year is one of the budget. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the budget ones where they can't really do many big bills at all. They can just wiggle within what they've already. Or maybe it is. A, this is the big year. This is the big. This year. is the biennial. Yeah. I think I'm almost positive. Is there a budget five years? 
Which would make a big difference. I think so. Yeah. So that would make this the short, but I don't know. I'd have to look. But there has been no. Um, there's so one of the WASDA. Um, I was looking ahead of note for a meeting. One of the WASDA priorities has been for the. With the so one of their priorities has been um, looking at what the state model is of what a school needs to, to be funded and that it's very outdated. And so WASDA for years has been saying, can you guys rework this? Can you look at this? Can you maybe provide more than one psychiatrist for the entire middle school population of the state? And that has been like such baby steps that they're not even close to looking at that and doing that, but it's something that WASDA just keeps chipping away at and hopefully so I'm not hearing a lot of enthusiasm for that. Other than I would. Yeah. I don't have to have everybody do it, but I'll do it. Yeah. I'm open. And basically, yeah, that's amazing. That's so you have to go round up other people to do it. That's well, and, and yeah. it's not completely. Um, in the one that I was doing, I kind of was Johnny come lately to it for various reasons. Um, and there were some administrators and some different people that were already on there um, doing some of the talking as well. It was basically just that representation of different groups um, and different people to help just get teachers, right? Or you just well, I had like some parents and some uh, community members that were on mine. Um, you know, it, it, it basically part of it was just providing different voices and different time availabilities for people because it was opened up. Um, the invitation was put out um, on Facebook. I'm not sure. I assume on the web the website that we had a list of was when they were going on. You know, so people could just get on, and we had somebody monitoring the questions that were coming through the chat and answering those plus we had you know points informational points that we were looking to make and so just wanting to get the word out as far as so that, that people understood the biggest challenge um that you'll find in the whole school funding model is that people have trouble understanding it I mean, even those of us on the board sometimes have trouble understanding it when we deal with it all the time um just because you know they talk about the maintenance and operation levy well aren't you taking care of maintenance well it's really not maintenance it's more for the blending than those other programs they relabel that isn't that they, they, they keep, keep relabeling well, well, it was educational programs okay. and operations you know what i think it probably started out as for me and stuff and morphed over time. I'm curious about the history of that. It actually started out as enrichment. Really? And <laughs> okay. got maintenance and operations. Well, it, because they state started funding less and less of the portion of education that was required. And as the state ran into budget shortfalls, they kept passing along more of the debt to the locals. So the local school districts kept raising their levy lids because they needed more money to actually operate the district. So it's there's we, we, if you want we, I'll give you a, a a book that gives the history back to okay. the seventies that's well walked it through. There's so many though like misconceptions on it. One of the ones that irritated the heck out of me was be having a special election for this in February. It's like because of school funding and because you don't want to lay off you know a large portion of your staff and then rehire them later that summer like it february is the only date because in america we only have four voting no, days and they the sync it up with the other school districts generous well, okay. so and, and, and that's not that's like, and that's not just a fluke that they sync it up either it's because every single school district kind of knows these rules of we don't want to have to rip people in april just to rehire and august is well, it's incredibly disruptive because a lot of the staff, especially in a competitive job market, leave. They don't stick around to be retired in August. They go get jobs in other places. So it's it's incredibly disruptive to the entire community. And it, it 
it prevents collaborative planning from coming here. And, you know, there's just lots of, of things that make it really a challenge and frustrate those of us that have been on the board for a while and the movies as well. So, okay. Any other prompts for like um, the um, events where you have spreading the information for the community members? Do you guys have like student represented in it too or do you but do you also want student represented too because the levy like are the things that impact the student and i know lots of students will wish to also be in it and spreading out the words because with because if the levy fell um many of us are going to be devastated of course and i know from like the point of view of like the student who are like the one who get impacted like this we have like the experience of you know being the one who get you know, the stuff. So I know that lots of students would like to, you know, spread other words and yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You can be yeah. on my uh, yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, you want to be on the aisle one too, Jazzy? Yeah, actually right now uh, I'm working with Trip down at the high school for my leadership project on like spreading the word about levy, like young voters. So that's my leadership project. Yeah, definitely having the student voice on those meetings for people, you know, and not, not limited to you guys if there's other students that are interested. Set sure. things up. They're connected. They're connected. So, yeah, up to Dr. Pritt. And yep. Yeah. Well, we'll get you guys coordinated on the town halls too. That'd be great. And just for, um, of the odd years or budget years and the 105 days, even years of shorter sessions. So this is a shorter session here. I mean, no. So this is the year where they can't really do much. They, they have let, yeah, they're, they're hopefully more fun. Oh, sure. <laughs> you go with that. <laughs> didn't sound like a I'm, I'm going to live in my bubble. Okay, good. Well, thanks again, Heather. Thank you, Mark. And to everyone who's working on the levy, thank you. Um, so. Okay, so next we go to uh, section six of our meeting to focus on students. And the first item there is the, um, the review of the monitoring report, the results policy 2.5, R2.5 social studies. Um, again, just for clarification and not supposed to be too really repetitive. Um, but this is a report that we were given uh, previously so that we could have a chance to read it and go through and then discuss it tonight. Um, the report or the results policies, um, those when we get those reports, we're not uh, judging them on compliance, partially compliant or non-compliant. Here we're looking on whether or not the the goal for uh, is demonstrating the reasonable progress or not demonstrating reasonable progress. Um, and like I kind of alluded to earlier, in this case, I think that we'll see that COVID kind of really played into some of the progress that was made. Um, but again, I, I love this report because until we had the, this information two years ago where we started with it, we really had had never talked about the social studies program within the board meetings and that portion of the curriculum and how are we doing it and just seeing some of the changes that have come forth from the 2019 report to now and some of the changes in thought process with that are, are great to see and, and yeah make are just a, a testimony to the, the power of the the coherent governance model. So with that, I'll open up the floor. Um, I guess, Faye, do you have any opening comments or anything? Or? You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that would be my, my caveat. And as we wrote in the report, um, shortly after we submitted the last monitoring report, we went into the school closures um, and then had to completely shift what we were doing, the curriculums we were using. Um, and then this year, just kind of really transitioning back in. So, thank you. So, same so, questions, comments, 
thoughts? Um, I'm, uh, you know, the, the uh, audit of the materials that were, you know, um, out of out of date and uh, and in the cycle for replacing them. Um, I mean, uh, is there um, the I guess I just want to know where, where, where oh, you must be replacing some, you know, on the timeline, there must be some upgrades going on this year and then coming up. Um, what materials, where do you find the materials that you are going to be using? Um, Peggy, that's a great question. One of the things that we do have is um, we've got a little bit behind in our curriculum adoption process. So as you noticed in the ESSA presentation last year, elementary, um, adopted their K-5 ELA curriculum. This year, we're focusing on a K-12 math adoption, moving into adoption a curriculum next fall. Um, so we are kind of like working on curriculum areas by curriculum areas. So our goal is to look at social studies in beginning in 2023. However, what I will say, and Kelly can speak a little bit to this, that uh, elementary with art and some of their social studies pieces, uh, we do a lot of supplementing. Um, our teachers have, and as you can see, very old textbooks, especially at secondary level. So they um, pull in from current resources and supplement with what they have. And Kelly, I'll let you talk a little bit about ARC and Studies Weekly. Sure. Um, I think those are, that's a really great question because you're asking um, not only about social studies curriculum, but I'm guessing you're wondering curriculum in general, how do we potentially kind of vet those or find those or screen those? And having just gone through that process with the ELA adoption, the English language arts adoption at the elementary level, and now we've moved into the math adoption, we typically start with, um, with both of those, we start with program called Ed Reports. And so Ed Reports um, are an online um, material review um, where they are vetted based on a number of different um, gateways. So what happens is we typically start by reviewing the availability of resources within Ed Reports. So basically anything that's available for adoption has been screened and vetted there by a team of educators um, for a number of different hours for very specific criteria. So we start there. Um, and then typically what we do is we would order samples of materials to bring back to our teams and then further vet those before we ever even consider piloting those materials. So it's a really comprehensive process that typically takes a number of months. And actually when we ended up, um, or years, when we ended up bringing the ELA back, it was about a two year process and we presented it to the board last year. And um, there were lots of reviews of curriculum, even a community review process that goes with That's it too. Yes, yeah. 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 processes. Absolutely. Well, actually, with the, with the English, the English language arts adoption last year, there was a community input process part of it, and they had it up, but nobody in the community said anything. Well, see, so we asked kind of for surprises me because I. But we yeah. asked one thing I heard a lot of was like. I can't even see the materials. It's like, well, there must be a place no, where you can see the materials. They were there. And that was at the meeting. Um, they said they hadn't gotten any input from it. So we asked as a board for you to please extend that community input because we really want that. Yeah, well, Kevin said that. Like, you know, yeah. And it's like, so, okay, well, where's the breakdown in community? Because it seems like there is a huge amount of interest in yeah. content. As, and as, and as, a, um, as a parent, I got an email about it. So parents got an email. It was on the website. It was clear on there. It's there. Um, so I don't wonder how many people actually look at the website. I'm just curious. If you're a parent, you got an email. email you should. Yeah. And if you're not a parent, I mean, yes, you can look at this. You can look at the curriculum as well, but it's. And I appreciated that about the board because you did ask us to go back and do a little bit more advertisement about mm -hmm. it um, to try to elicit that conversation with the community. So for that circumstance, we actually, um, I was on the radio even talking about it. <laughs> I got to do an interview, which is great. And um, we did, you know, that's what we did a press release about it and it was posted. So I did appreciate that we were really trying to encourage it in the last, um, one of our last adoption. So there's a very um, intentional board policy that aligns our adoption of any set of instructional materials. And so what's happening at this point is we are going through this replacement cycle 
um, basically year by year, there are specific materials that have been outlined for replacement. So right now we are in the map portion of that. And then we will continue on. And I feel really fortunate that we were able to use those ESSER funds because when we failed that levy initially, we actually had to put the replacement cycle on, on pause and on hold um, because we weren't able to move forward with that at that time. So I'm really grateful we're able to use those funds and continue on through this process. So yeah, the curriculum is not cheap. You know, no, it's a no. huge expense for right. some so ELA materials that you're adopting are $1.33 million. Um, and I mean, our elementary materials are significantly outdated, so it is, a, it is a cost, but the bottom line is that is what we are continuing to work off of as we are um, cycling through in terms of updating our materials. I have a related question as far as the age of the materials. It seems like the AP stuff on here is a lot, well, is generally newer than the rest of it. Is that a requirement of the AP College Board? And how often do they require things to be updated? Because I'm kind of asking that on a, that's great for the AP kids, but a, an equity type of. That's a great question, Melinda. And I can find that information out for you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't. That's okay. I can, I will definitely ask and tell that to you. Well, I certainly appreciated the look at the, um, speaking of AP classes, at, you know, who are going into them, how can we encourage more, you know, I, I think that we kind of scratched the surface with some of that data, and I don't know that it's a real, um, in my mind, I would question the validity of the comparison, just because you're dealing with pre-COVID and mid-COVID, and how does that all you know, track, but the fact that we're actually looking at that and encouraging kids to be thinking or at least working towards encouraging kids considering those AP classes. Um, because again, I think setting that bar higher, even if, if they get you know partially to it, they're getting more than if the bar is low and they get over it. Um, I also applaud the looking at trying to get some stand, uh, standardization or um, equalization between teachers and classes and grading, you know, so that we do have a little more comparison across the, you know, an A in this class is the same as an A in this class, not, you know, an A in this class is a B in this class. Um, was curious and probably a question that maybe should or shouldn't ask, but we were looking at the courses taken by the different grade levels and the number of Ds or no credits. Did we do any correlation if there was any teacher um, you know, just in, in the sense of, you know, are younger teachers having more trouble connecting or older? I actually, oh, sorry, Kevin. Oh, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I actually didn't even think about that, but that would be a, a good thing to work on with our Yeah, because, I mean, I think that might go along with that standardization to see, you know, maybe some teacher is harder, to, you know, is a, a tougher grader and or, um, you know, maybe there are teachers who are connecting better and we need to utilize their skills to help develop some of the other teachers. I mean, as far as professional development. Other comments? I had kind of comments the same or similar in vain on the AP stuff as you, Kevin. Um, and I know with COVID throwing a wrench into things definitely has upended stuff, but I'm hoping that going forward we can we can focus on having a range of, of challenging courses offered for all students. Um, I believe the last time APOS history was offered was 2017. And in 2019, when my, uh, my other son was interested in it, it wasn't offered. And I was like, well, why not? And got the question, oh, we asked the kids and they didn't want to take it. And it's like, so that you talked in here about how do we how do we get kids into those classes and the whole self-select versus you know recruiting or you know telling them yes you can do it doing the double dutch yeah. let's do the double dutch with AP um, but with the the you know an easy A over here mm. and an AP US history is a really tough class if somebody's really concerned about their GPA. And there's not somebody saying they're like, no, I know you have the skills. 
you can do this. You're gonna get less and less kids choosing A push and going for an easy A. And then it's been five years and you don't have A push and you've kind of lost your culture of being an academically rigorous or offering academic rigor. So are AP classes just open to anybody who wants to take them or do you have to maintain a certain GPA to get into them or? No prerequisites as, as I understand it, but I, I know the US history, the rumor at our house when that was, uh, that class is like, you know, there's way too much homework, there's way too much, it's not worth it, go with this when you'll get a better grade, you know? And I always go back to the adage of somehow we've got to get rid of that GPA or, or equalize it out or weight it or something, because potentially getting a C in an AP class that has harder rigor, you may learn more than A in, so my older son had taken it and learned so much. He is definitely our history guru. My younger son, who couldn't take it, took the history class and did the self study on the side and got like the book and such. And he did fine, but it's like each year it just dilutes and dilutes and it dilutes. And it's the teacher gave them like, here's some things you can study on your own. But something about being in a class and just like we're all in this together and we're it just I'm afraid that as years go on it's just going to be like oh we don't do that here they so often like say honors classes yeah they do separate say, sorts of things that is an AP class at the end of it they can take a test and if they get the yeah, yeah, yeah. they get the college credit the honors class on Kelsey um, okay, so the honor class is different than the AP classes because um, usually people take honors because there's like weighted GPA and also like or unweighted GPA, but our school doesn't have like weighted or unweighted, just, um, unweighted. So people just take honor classes because it's kind of satisfied them to like you know get the better chance of like learning a difficult um stuff the difficult um materials in the same subject at that level. Um, but while people who take AP just um, usually want um, college credit, like um, around 2019, I've taken a push. It was very hard. <laughs> and I heard like, there's um, there's a culture like, do not, get, do not take this teacher because he's a very hard grader. But at the same time, after I taken the test for like a push at the end of the year, um, and I transferred the credit to the um, WCC. Um, even though I have a, like an okay score, all that credit like helped me um, remove lots of my um, prerequisites. And that was like, that's just all worth it to me in general to take the AP class and get the credit and then transfer it around to like, you know, the schools and college board. That just help a lot of students, you know, save money. <laughs> and, yeah. There's a lot of, there's the saving money for college and there's also the self-efficacy of doing something, you can do it. And so then you go and you do the next thing and then you do the next thing and just the whole. It, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak. And you could build the confidence and, and it, you know, as you mentioned, the AP classes and being able to take, you know, those get that college credit. Um, we, we talked in here about trying to eliminate some of the barriers as far as of taking those tests, but it, it can be substantial. I mean, our oldest basically wiped a year out of college because of his AP credits. You know, that's a substantial. And how does it compare to running start, which I mean, I know that the quality might be. Well, one of the benefits of having AP at the high school is that you keep those kids at the high school. That's true. Uh, running start, you they're not there. And so the community, I think, of that. Is AP credits were transferable then. Depends on what score you get on the test. You do have to take the test and the test is um, cost money, which is something also equity wise, but we've talked about making them more equitable for um, all students to take them who want to take them. Um, some yeah, students it, just it depends do on the, the test. It depends on the, the college and the score you get, you know, what happens, but it, does, it offers people because there are some parents who just assume their children not be going to college until their college age and, you know, um, what is more popular with AP at the high school is that AP is offered around, some freshmen can also take it, 
and also a sophomore can take it, like all, almost all class level, except for running start, which only starts in junior and to senior. Mm -hmm. So do they offer IB courses as well? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just okay. Other comments or questions? I think, you know, I, I think this, like I said, it's great information. There's a lot of room to um, improve, um, but at least we're talking about it. Because like I said, prior to the coherent governance, social studies was kind of not even on the radar, which you know, obviously it needs to be. So thank you for the report you guys put together. Um, again, board members, if you get your summary sheets to me, that would be great. And then I'll put the other summary that will show up on the um, consent agenda next month. Okay. So with that, this takes us on to item 6.02, which is a report on the academic and well being recovery plan in phase two. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Faith. Uh, it's just going to be a very, very brief um, overview. Mark and I today um, submitted our anticipation that we are working our plan, that we are communicating our plan. As you saw tonight, we're communicating how we're spending our rest of dollars with various stakeholders. Um, Parts of the, and Kelly and I have been very involved in the um, execution of the plan in terms of um, ensuring that we have the diagnostic supports for both academics and social emotional learning in place. And then, do you want to explain what diagnostic? Yeah. So okay. it's like um, assessments that we use throughout the year. Um, at K through eight, we use iReady to look at. Um, English reading and math. And then we also, um, in high school, they have more because it, there's so many individual courses and they'll have um, assessments between like, more common assessments versus a diagnostic assessment that we purchase as a program. Um, so for social emotional learning, we have Panorama, which is a survey we administer three times a year. Which is the same we use iReady three times a year as well to do a beginning and mid um, and end of year assessment. And what those tools allow us to do is identify the needs of our students and then put supports in place to help bridge um, different learning gaps. Okay. Oh, is, is it okay to ask a question? Okay. So um, I've had parents ask about Panorama, you know, that's got that kind of a connotation. Thanks to, well, anyway, um, uh, uh, can parents see what's asked on the surveys and, and, the, and the, the things that, that you use Panorama for? They can absolutely um, touch base with their students' um, school counselor and they can walk them through the survey questions. And there are also really great reports that Panorama provides that you're also help to families at like our semester report card time okay. that, that shows kind of the response and how it uh, has broken out. Um, so there's some great resources for that family communication if parents have wonderings about that too. Okay. That we have available. I guess my question is the whole the whole process. Um, you know, you just administer well-being surveys to students, or how does this work? Um, so the panorama survey is taken three times a year and it asks a series of questions looking at things like self-efficacy, um, growth mindset, um, self-regulation, and asks questions around those themes and then provides information on, um, we can look at it from a district level, we can look at it from a school level, we can look at it from an individual level to see what supports that we can put in place to support either individuals, small groups, or whole school um, interventions to support that growth in social and emotional learning. Um, so, I mean, are these surveys voluntary or is this, I mean, just... We do, we ask the students to take it. We, you know, they, I would say we had Pretty high response rate from this first survey. 
I just have had parents ask about this. It's like, okay, you know, my kid came home with this survey and I'm really upset because, you know, I saw this, they were asking this question or that question. And so that's why I was wondering if I could just find, you know, if you could put out information for families so that they would be clearer, you know, again, the transparency thing about what surveys actually are used for, whether they're optional, um, you know, who they're administered to. Um, uh, just be really open about what's being done with them, what, what happens to the information once it's collected, who all receives it, does it stay within the school, is it used by other, you know, um, other entities as well, I, I, those are just questions that I've been asked to ask, so I'm asking. The panorama stays within the school the district, um, doesn't go outside of that, and it is used um, to provide interventions um, you heard on the ESSA piece about our intervention specialists. They'll use some of that data. Our classroom teachers will use that data to support kids. Um, the Healthy Youth Survey, that is a survey that is voluntary that students longitudinally take. And that data is um, non-identifiable by student, whereas the panorama is identifiable by student. That's why it stays in-house. Um, and then the Healthy Youth Survey is a state, county, um, provides us with data at that level as well as um, I think it would be good the school district to, you know, put something together to explain why, you know, kids are given surveys, what's asked on those surveys, where that data goes and how it's being used, because I think that would go a long way toward dispelling some, some concerns. Sure. about use of information and um would it be also a good idea because i know that like um every single year like before the year school year start um lots of teachers just hand out pamphlets to like the parents assign if we could have like something like that like just inform student uh parents about the information that the surveys that students are going to take or like just like various things like that as um you know the parents can sign it and you know agree on it would that be good no i would think so i mean i'm just thinking of it from a from a perception standpoint you know the, the, these are the things that, that get people worked up you know and maybe maybe there's nothing to it and you know if there was just more communication and and you know just a laying out of things so they can see this is what it is and this is where it goes and you know. In, in an information vacuum or information void, people make up their own details. Well, and you're, you know, and people got good imaginations. You do. <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> you know. so, yeah, so having that information, I mean, I think you're right. That would go a long way in the transparency and just helping people understand. And then if they do have questions, where to go get more information? Because it sounds like the information is available, they can access that. Um, but sometimes they don't know it until after the fact, and that's always creates a frustration. Or, or even knowing, you know, that maybe something is voluntary and, and, you know, they can opt out of it. Just having the control, you know, to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that. So. And at the same time, explaining why the district does yeah, it. Because in, in some of those cases, it's so we can support the students better. Um, yeah, in most of the cases, I should say. So it's, it's been and that very much goes back to our conversation earlier when we are talking about the learning and we're talking about meeting the needs of our students in terms of social emotional learning, which is very much part of the, the well-being or the plan that we're talking about tonight. Um, the academic and well-being recovery plan is we are very much tasked with, with addressing the social emotional needs of our students in a way that is um, that we can monitor regularly. And so that is one of the pieces that we have included that we continue to, um, to work through and can continue to receive feedback and grow in. Um, but that is some, a part of our plan. So we use the iReady um, diagnostic three times a year um, for K through eight students, as well as Panorama um, three times a year as well. What other key components? And then the other piece is just the um, putting in the identified supports to support our students when we have the data so that we know what we're supporting them on. Um, as you had in the levy presentation, the NTSS multi-care system support, that is a big part of our academic and well-being plan, is to put those systems into place to support our students 
um, accessing both social and emotional learning and academic learning. Um, and just looking at making sure that we can help all of our kids access readable curriculum. Um, one of the one of the big pieces that we put in place was summer school. That was a um, where we used the data to invite students to come to summer school. We had a really robust um, summer school program, so that was one of one of our um, interventions that we made sure that we provided for our students. Um, really focusing on relationship building, on belonging, on building that. Um, connection to school through whatever pieces of connection our kids on. As I said, it's one caring dot. Um, so how do we make sure that all of our kids are um, on Or anything else you want to add? Okay. Any other questions? So this is was the, the phase one you decide how to send it the phase two is how we're diagnosing it how we're measuring it and then phase three you're going to show us the results of it right so what would you guys consider success in the results what results are you looking for that you'd be like home run but i would say phase three is also like not just looking at results but it's looking at continuous improvement so what do we need to continue because we know this isn't going to be over in a year we're not uh, we, we're gonna, we have a long way, you know, long way to go and a long way to support our kids as they return. Um, and we're still navigating the pandemic. So phase three will be really looking at like, looking at our iReady data, looking at our panorama data from all three assessments, um, looking at where we are with our MTSS implementation. That will be the year, end of year one of three for implement, implementing an MTSS system. Um, and then working like where do we need to go to continue moving this forward next year so like the success could be identifying those parts that need more and then you just come in on them more well also looking at student data as well and monitoring that very closely okay and shrink growth any other questions Thank you, Faye, Kelly. Um, so next on the agenda, item seven is sharing, and we'll start with our student board members. So, um, Jazzy. Um, it's already super late. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask the student board. Um, so the holiday is coming, and the district, I just saw the district Instagram post there. Um, the high school did all decorations. Um, that, uh, lots of student volunteer and, and you know the holidays just look really Christmas giving the student spirits. Um, tomorrow, um, so usually the choir has, at the high school has the winter concerts and also um, other concerts with, which we sing Christmas songs. But due to like COVID and lots of things happening this year, uh, we merge both of them to one concert. So tomorrow is open to all um, community members. Um, who can come in, um, donate for treats to help us, you know, fundraise for you know our church um, for like choir, and we're gonna sing Christmas songs. So, um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is so uh, I've been working with well the um, principal at our high school student committee. I think I talked about it uh, a couple. Of um, board meetings before. And that meeting, we just have lots of students coming in to just give out ideas and talk to the administrations about what's going on, what the issues that they're dealing with. And just been working with the administrations of our school to fix issues and all of that stuff. And uh, one of the things um, that, you know, students come up with, like little committees that can happen at our schools, like, for example, students can come and volunteer to like pick up trash in us at our high schools because um, there's like sometimes lots of trash and those can count as like community community services and which are good because lots of students especially seniors who are needing community service services for you know uh college applications and all that stuff so yeah um i was gonna just talk about why they think i'm doing a trick but I already spoke with that, so other than that, no. 
Thank you. Um, so, board members. Steve, Peggy, Melinda, I'll speak at once. Okay. Great guy in Seminole. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even gotten a treat yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm looking forward. The whole family will be home as of Christmas Eve. Granted, it'll be late Christmas Eve. Okay. Better late than never. Better late than never. I think if I get him home from the airport in time, Santa won't see us. So we'll get that. So, uh, Mark. Uh, the only thing I've got is just a little teaser for the new year. Um, your favorite document of the year is coming in January, uh, the F-196, which is the uh, year-end um, report that we are creating for OSPI. So that will be coming after the first of the year. So something to look forward to. Always Mark's favorite. Lots of numbers and lots of columns and lots of pages. Well, a big, huge budget. It's yeah. the year end. It's the so the the F one ninety five is the budget. The F one ninety six is the year end. Yeah, financial reporting. Yeah. Okay. Um. The rest of the executive team. You guys have to come up with something next month. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. So they were they were sharing throughout. So yeah. We'll give them credit for that. So that brings us to items eight and nine on the agenda, the superintendent and board's consent agendas. Um, these are all the superintendent's consent agenda. It's administrative matters that are delegated to the superintendent, um, but they do require approval by the board. The board items similarly are consent, the consent agenda are items that are of the board's doing. All these items, the Open Public Meeting Act gives us the option to present it to us ahead of time and we can pass them all as one motion as opposed to each individual item. Um, just again, for informational purposes for Peggy and Steve, that doesn't mean that if we have something on there that you have a burning desire that we need to discuss or questions about that we can't do that. But these are items that are provided ahead of time in our routine business items um, that can be passed all in one motion. And so at this time, the chair will entertain your motion. I will make a motion to pass both these superintendent consent agenda with the change made to 8.10, replacing approving with authorizing, and the board consent agenda as attached. There are two and made five minutes. So it's been moved to pass the or to pass both the superintendent and board consent agendas with the one uh, modification made to item 8.10. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Consent agendas are passed. That brings us to item 10, which is the adjournment. There's no executive session this evening. Cool. And so um, I declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>